Good morning and greetings once again from Heritage Baptist Church. We're so glad to welcome you to our Sunday morning service today as we live stream to you from our activity center uh, here in Topayo. As I'm sure you are well aware, in just a couple of days, Christians around the world are going to be celebrating what we call Christmas. Normally, on the Sunday before Christmas here at HBC, we will present a special Christmas program. I said that is normally what we do. However, as you know, this past year of 2020 has been anything but normal. However, we did want to do a little something special this morning, an abbreviated Christmas program, if you will. And it's our sincere prayer and desire that your heart will be encouraged, that your heart will be gladdened as we consider the real meaning of the Christmas season. The story of Christmas actually begins some 700 years before Christ was born. It actually began when the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 14, made this prophecy. The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Again, in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6, the prophet said this. He said, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Let me invite you now, wherever you may be, to join with me and let's sing together that Christmas song, Joy to the World. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat it. Repeat. The sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns and fester grow. He comes to make his blessings flow. For as the curse is found, for as the curse is found, for a house, for as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations grow. The glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love and wonders of His love and the wonders, wonders of His love. Thank you so much for joining with us in the singing of that carol. Now let me invite you to sit back and to listen as two of our young ladies, Mayville and Trish LaRosa, sing for us the carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. <laughs> Silent stars go by, yet in my dark street. 
town of Bethlehem some 2,000 years ago, but the Bible records for us in Luke chapter 2, verse 7 to verse number 14, that Mary brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people." For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men." Would you please lift up your voices with me once again and let's sing together the carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the newborn King, be so and mercy, my O God, and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing. Yeah. 
After the angels had delivered their glorious message that a Savior was going to come who would bring peace and goodwill to all men, the Bible says to us in Luke chapter 2, verse 15 and verse 17, that it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary, and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. Join with me now one more time as we sing another carol entitled, O Come, All Ye Faithful. those shepherds departed from the manger that night, and they began to share with the people that they met the wonderful news that they had heard and the wonderful things that they had seen, there was one solitary question that filled the hearts and the minds of everyone who heard their testimony, and the question was simply this, what child is this? Listen with me as we hear Aidan Coe playing for us on his violin the song, What Child Is This?
Certainly that was a most blessed night when Jesus Christ in the fulfillment of prophecy came and was born on this earth that He might become the Savior who would bring goodwill and peace to all men. With that thought in mind, I would like for you this morning to turn with me in your Bibles for a few minutes to the book of Luke chapter 2. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, goodwill to all men. Goodwill to all men. As you come through the Bible, you find that there are three key points that are very important to properly understanding what the Bible is all about. First thing that I want us to notice is, number one, God's creation. God's creation. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and verse number 1, the very first verse of the Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That same truth is then stated again in the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse number 3, where the Bible declares that all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And someone has well noted, God doesn't make junk. God doesn't make junk. That's why after the creation was all completed in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, the Bible says, God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was, notice it, not just good, it was very good. It was very good. And so the first thing we need to understand, to have a proper understanding of the Scripture, is God's creation. Secondly, we need to understand Adam's choice. Adam's choice. After the Lord God had created Adam and Eve in His own image and in His own likeness, He placed them in a perfect environment. He put them in the Garden of Eden. And, and, and there was only one expectation, one commandment that was expected of them. It's found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, when the Lord God said, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. But then in the very next chapter, in Genesis chapter 3, we find that Satan showed up on the scene. Satan came in with his deceitful lies. And Satan began to tell Adam and Eve, Oh, you can eat this fruit. You will not truly die. And he also made the implication that, You know, God is really cruel. He is holding back from you that which is the very best. Because God knows if you eat this fruit and you'll be just like God, and you'll be able to know good and, and, and evil. And, and so he came with his lies, and, and sadly, sadly, Adam and Eve exercised the free choice that God has given to all men, and they chose to believe Satan and to ignore God. And because of their choice, they immediately died spiritually. Their relationship with God was now broken. But not only did they immediately die spiritually, they began to die physically. But that isn't all. That isn't all. They passed that death to their children. And their children passed it to their grandchildren. And from generation to generation to generation, to me, to you, that same death has been passed down. That's why the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12 said, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. There was God's creation. There was Adam's choice. But then I want you to notice thirdly, in the Scriptures we find God's compassion. God's compassion. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 9, that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And again, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, in verse number 4, the Apostle Paul writes concerning our God, is that He will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
The bottom line is simply this. It is not God's will for any man to die without Christ and spend eternity in hell. God's will for all men is that they might be saved. And in order for that to be a reality, God sent a Savior. God sent a Savior. But I want you to understand, as someone is well noted, that if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. And if our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. And if our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. And therefore, God sent a Savior. And that is why on the night when the Lord Jesus was born in the city of Bethlehem, as we read in the Scripture just a few moments ago, the angelic host there proclaimed to the shepherds who were watching over their flocks the wonderful message in verse number 11 of Luke chapter 2, where it says, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, please understand that just being born into the world and just being declared a Savior by the angels of heaven, that did not make a result that would bring peace and goodwill to all men. In fact, in order for peace and goodwill to come to all men, there were three things that were necessary. And I want us to notice these together for the next few minutes. First of all, in order for us to have peace and goodwill, there had to be, number one, the transaction. There had to be the transaction. Right after he had led Adam and Eve into sin, the Lord God spoke to Satan. And here's what he said to him. In Genesis 3.15, God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Did you catch it? Did, did you see what he said there? Uh, we know from biology, from a simple study of basic biology, we know that the woman provides the egg. The man provides the seed. And when those two are coming together, that is when conception takes place, when a new life is created. However, the Lord God declared there would come a day, look at it again very closely, there would come a day when the woman would have a seed. In other words, the Lord God is declaring way back in the book of Genesis chapter 3 that there would be a day when there would be a woman who would give birth to a child without the aid of a man. That's exactly what the prophet foretold. Again, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Some 700 years later, the angel Gabriel then appeared to a young virgin by the name of Mary, and informed her that she was the one that God in his sovereignty had chosen to be the one who would bring into the world the Christ child. But you remember how she responded? In Luke chapter 1 and verse 34, her response was, How can this be? How can this be, seeing I know not a man? I'm a virgin. How is it possible that I would have a child? Now why is all of this so important? Why is this such an important point in Christian faith? And the reason is simply because of the fact, if Jesus Christ had not been born of a virgin, if Jesus Christ had been born with the seed of a man, like you and I were born, then Jesus Christ would have inherited that same sin nature that you and I have. However, He was born of a virgin. And because He was born of a virgin, the Bible declares in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, that He did no sin. Neither was any guile. There was no deceitfulness found in His mouth. 
And yet there came a day, there came a day when there was the transaction. There came a day of transaction. There came that day when that sinless Son of God took my sin and took your sin and allowed it to be placed upon himself. The prophet Isaiah foretold how this would happen. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse number 6, the Bible says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that's exactly what happened. When Jesus Christ prepared to go to the cross of Calvary, the Apostle Paul describes it for us in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, wherein it says, For He, that is God the Father, hath made Him, that is God the Son, to be sin for us who knew no sin. He had no sin. But the transaction was made. Our sin was transferred to Him. And in order for Him to be our Savior, that was a very necessary thing. In order for us to have peace and goodwill with God, there had to be the transaction number two. There also had to be the crucifixion. There had to be the crucifixion. You see, in the Old Testament Scriptures, the Lord God made it very clear when He said to Moses in Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11, The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it unto you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. So therefore, as you read through the Old Testament Scriptures, you will find time and again how that men would come to the tabernacle or they would come to the temple and there they would shed the blood of sacrificial animals that would cover their sin so that their relationship with God, which had been broken by sin, might be restored. The New Testament declares this very truth. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 22, it says simply, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no covering. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But there was one drawback to this sacrificial plan. And the drawback is found in Hebrews, chapter 10, and verse number 4, where it says that it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. You see, the blood of bulls and goats could cover sin, but it could not wash it away. It could not cleanse us of sin. And therefore, that is why it is such a wonderful message that we find concerning the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 1 and verse number 29 when He was declared to be the Lamb of God Notice it, which taketh away the sin of the world. That is why the Bible declares for us in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, it is the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, that cleanses us from all sin. It is not doing good works. It is not keeping sacraments. It is not going through the waters of baptism. None of those things can cleanse us of our sin. It is only when the shed blood of Christ is applied to our hearts that our sin can be totally taken away. Robert Lowry in the year 1876 was absolutely right when he wrote the words, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That is why when we who have received the Lord Jesus as our Savior are taken to heaven, when we go to heaven, there's going to be a song that we're going to sing. In fact, the Bible tells us it's going to be a new song. It's a song we've not sung before. But it's mentioned in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Look at it. We will sing a new song saying, Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God 
by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation in order to be our Savior, in order to be our Savior, in order to bring peace and goodwill to all men, there had to be the transaction. There, there had to be the crucifixion. But then I want you to notice there also, number three, had to be the resurrection. There had to be the resurrection. You see, if the Lord Jesus died on the cross, and that was the end of the story, if the Lord Jesus died on the cross and, and there was nothing left uh, uh, else to tell, th then Christians would be making pilgrimages to the tomb where he was buried. Christians would be visiting the tomb and, 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 and our faith. While it might help us to be better people during this life, it would give us no assurance of eternity in heaven. In other words... If the cross is where the Christian message ends, then we are just like Thomas Hobbes, who said on his deathbed, Now I am about to take my last voyage, a great leap in the dark. But for the child of God, we don't have to have such a gloomy outlook. We don't have to have such a sad statement to cross our lips. In other words, we are able to express great hope and great confidence because of the fact that when Jesus Christ came to the earth, not only did He die for us, but He arose again from the dead. Let me just tell you this morning that a dead Savior can never give anybody eternal life. A dead Savior can never give anyone eternal life. That's why the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, that Jesus Christ was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. And then notice Romans 5, 10, where the Apostle Paul writes, For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. In other words, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are saved from the penalty of our sin by His death. But it's because of His resurrection from the dead that we shall be saved from the very presence of of sin when He comes and takes us to our eternal home. You see, the truth is, the truth is, Christmas is just an empty, meaningless Christian holiday if it does not point us to the cross of Calvary and the empty tomb. In other words, the Christmas season should always remind us that the Lord Jesus came to be a part of the human race so that He, by the grace of God, might become the propitiation, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. In other words, He might become the full payment for our sin. And it's because of Christmas then that the Apostle Paul was able to say in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. During this Christmas season, there are many who will be exchanging gifts. And we all understand the concept of a gift. A gift is something that someone has purchased. They have gone to an expense in order to give it to us. And here's the point I want you to understand that no matter how precious a gift may be, and no matter how much that gift may have cost, it will never do you any good until you receive it. It will never be of a benefit to you until you accept it and receive it. And so it is with the gift of God. So it is with God's salvation. It has been bought and paid for with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And it is now freely offered to whosoever will humble themselves and simply receive it. That's why the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, 
that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. Whoever will humble themselves, acknowledge their sin, acknowledge their sinfulness against God, and acknowledge their trust that what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary totally paid for their sin. If they'll believe that and believe that God has raised him from the dead, then they will, they will be saved. When we think about that message, when we think about that message of hope that we have because Jesus Christ came into the world, it's no wonder that the angel said in Luke chapter 2, verse 14, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. I want you to understand this morning that this was not simply a peace and goodwill between men. This is not simply a peace and goodwill between nations. Rather, this was peace and goodwill that is now possible between a holy God and sinful men because of the transaction that was made, the crucifixion that was endured, and the resurrection from the dead. And so my question to you is simply this. The gift has been bought and paid for. Have you received it? That's the question. Have you received that most wonderful gift? Has there been a time when you repented of your sin and you received Christ as your personal Savior? If you've never done that, then certainly I would encourage you today to very seriously consider doing that before another day passes. And if you know Christ as your Savior, oh, how we ought to celebrate this Christmas season while we enjoy the gifts that other people give to us we ought to be most thankful for that most precious gift that God gave when He sent His Son into the world and through Him gave to us the gift of salvation. Our Father, we thank You this morning for the wonderful truth of the Gospel. We thank You for the Christmas story where it all begins. And Lord, I pray that this morning, even now, that by Your Holy Spirit, that You would work in each heart and in each life, that you might save those this morning who are listening. They've never trusted in you as their Savior. May today they understand the truth that has been presented. And may they receive your gift of salvation. And for those of us who are saved, may we, may we be faithful to rejoice in it. And may we also be faithful to be sharing this good news. Just like those shepherds did. May we be faithful to tell everybody we know, everybody we meet, that there is a Savior who has come into the world. Work in our hearts, work in our lives, and may you be honored and glorified, we pray in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us. And let me just remind you that we will not be having the afternoon service today, but I do hope that you'll take this, uh, we'll call it a downtime, uh, that you'll take the opportunity to share with those you know the wonderful story of Christmas. God bless you.